Life in Balance in the Time of COVID-19 by Pascal Biel It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief, it was the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light, it was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope, it was the winter of despair. We had everything before us. We had nothing before us. We were all going direct to heaven. We were all going direct the other way. Charles Dickens. What a strange time this is. Dickens' opening sentences from A Tale of Two Cities, written 170 years ago, ring true today as we live through the tumult that is COVID. This unseen virus has touched all of our lives to one degree or another. In just a few short months, we have modified our behaviour, re-evaluated that which is important to us, and retreated into the cocoons that are our homes. While essential workers worked stoically in the face of this disease, the rest of us sheltered at home, acknowledging their sacrifices in nightly choruses of ringing pots and pans and hand-clapping our appreciation. It has been a time of great stress and introspection, and the realisation that our very livelihoods, our self-assuredness and our dependence on the status quo are, in fact, quite tenuous. Time itself seems to have morphed from predictable and reliable to indeterminate and vague. As daily schedules, choreographed by school bells, working hours, appointments, meetings, squeezing in of exercise classes, and for many, ferrying kids to and fro, evaporated into the never-ending staycation that wasn't. Turning our once-organised homes into a mishmash home office classroom playground. Time, it seems, and the necessity to be governed by it has lost its relevance. How often have you heard, what day is it, when speaking with a friend on the phone? As the human race started to retreat from the world at large, it appears Mother Earth took a deep breath. By April, global emissions fell by 17%, and if levels hold, we are on track for the sharpest reductions in emissions since World War II, according to the report from the Nature, Climate Change and Global Carbon Project. Air quality in cities around the world improved and skies were free of aviation vapour trails. As the mechanical impact and man-made noise of our daily lives ebbed away, it was replaced, albeit temporarily, by melodious bird songs and sightings of unlikely creatures in urban environs. It was time for most people to take a deep breath. As our movements were curtailed, our habits were transformed. People sought sustenance and comfort, often in the form of food. People who had never baked took up sourdough bread making with gusto. Kids baked cookies. Everyone rushed to the stores, not just for toilet paper, but to buy flour in prodigious quantities. Questions bloomed on chat sites and Google searches. How to make a... Insert here your favourite snack, treat, baguette, croissant, multigrain sourdough boule and Instagram posts were, and still are, flooded with an abundance of baked goods. I readily admit to being one of those ardent bakers, a little miffed, to be honest, when my trusty sources of flour suddenly evaporated. Where did all these bakers come from? Who knew that sourdough bread was to become a thing? I baked along with everyone else. There are few things more satisfying than the aroma of freshly baked bread in your kitchen. All my senses relaxed. It made, and still makes, me happy. MFK Fisher once wrote, No yoga exercise, no meditation in a chapel filled with music will rid you of your blues better than the humble task of making your own bread. No wonder there was no flour to be had. Honestly, I baked as a way to deal with stress. The tsunami of event closures that rolled over the hospitality industry in the spring was breathtaking in its catastrophic magnitude. By the middle of March, as lockdown progressed, things looked grim. 
From a personal standpoint, not only were all cooking classes, demos and in-person events cancelled, so too was the book tour for my latest cookbook, Salad 2. What to do? After a week of shell-shocked inaction, I mulled over the most effective way to communicate with the world at large. One morning, sipping on a hot espresso in my trusty keep calm and carry on mug, I scrolled through Instagram posts, as one does, and came across a live feed from cookbook author and chef David Leibovitz. He was in lockdown in Paris. His book tour had also been cancelled, so he decided to take to the airwaves and talk to his legions of fans about his latest book, Drinking French. As a side note, it says something about everyone's collective frame of mind when thousands of people around the world are tuning in early in the morning to watch him make and talk about cocktails. He was enchanting, his life posts filled with funny anecdotes. His quintessentially French partner joined him. They were terrific and entertaining. I watched every morning. I also tuned in to watch my friend Kat Cora's Quarantine Cuisine show in the afternoons. What energy and positive messages they all had. An idea percolated, and so, armed with my phone strapped to a tripod by means of a strong elastic band, I too launched with some trepidation, into live streaming cooking demos. I write with trepidation for a reason. Live streaming is an odd medium, a one-way window into someone else's world. These days, usually their homes. Our homes are our private space and we control who can enter it. By going live, the ability to regulate who can open the door and step inside is gone. I was not sure what to expect. However, within a few short days, I had regular viewers from London to Melbourne, spanning a 17-hour window around the world. Friends joined in, peppering my live stream with banter, anecdotes and questions. Even though I could not see them, I felt their presence. It was uplifting and the response I got was uniformly positive. 33 days later, after making everything from salads to clafoutis, I took a day off to take stock. In that time frame, I had learnt a new expression, to pivot, otherwise known as restructuring your life and business in a ridiculously short period. Everyone has had to learn how to reinvent themselves and familiarise themselves with technologies they had, up until then, no inkling of. How many of us had never heard of Zoom, let alone hosted meetings, chats, birthday parties and multi-state conference calls on it? I realised two weeks into the Instagram live sessions that I could teach my cooking classes this way too. With a little apprehension, my trusty tripod with its low-tech attachments in hand, I launched into territories unknown, teaching virtual cooking classes. To my utter astonishment, it worked. Although participants could not smell or taste the food as I prepared it, they could cook along with me. This medium allowed people to join in from not just my hometown, but from all over the States and Europe and Australia as well. When asked, will you continue this after we get back to normal? The answer was and is an emphatic yes. As I look back over the upheaval of everything that is COVID-19, loved ones lost, the surreal experience of virtual funerals, cancelled graduations, commemorations and celebrations. I contemplate the uncertainty of the coming months, the future of our businesses and our collective health. It is comforting to know that there are things that offer solace. We may not be able to attend concerts, but choirs have sung, spliced together in harmonic convergence by maestros of digital technology. We may not be able to play sports together, but we take heart when watching two little girls playing tennis across the rooftops of Finale Liguria in Italy. We may not be able to travel, but we can still pull up a virtual chair at a dining table and share our common meal across hundreds of miles. As I read research reports on the effects of this pandemic on our collective psyches, one thread stands out. Growing and making something calms us. From container gardening to nourishing blooming sourdough starters, nurturing ourselves and our loved ones helps us stay sane. In an unscientific survey of friends and colleagues, I asked what had changed for them during these past few months. 
Their responses ran the gamut from delight in discovering new foods and healthy choices. One wrote, we have gone totally vegetarian and it's been fun adjusting our recipes, but it's been even more fun since we are cooking the vegetables we've been growing ourselves. Another said to me, I've been making bread because of you, like a wee factory. One of the things we came up with was posh beans on toast. It's beans of any kinds mashed a bit with sautéed onions, garlic and whatever you have around. I add a bit of hemp seed pesto as well. We always have that. Put it on toast with or without tomatoes or avocado. My eldest, who doesn't cook, says this will be a staple for her going back to college. Best thing is cooking whatever I fancy in being able to have the time. Yet another wrote, Yes, I've been making delicious salsa verde, homemade marinara, and started making all manner of oddball smoothies. Most satisfying are naughty bready bakes. Two, the frustration about just how much cooking we have to do. One friend said to me, Yes, I love cooking when I'm not expected to do it every few hours while working 10 to 12 hours a day and trying to be a good wife and a mum to a wonderful but increasingly restless teenager. I dream about going to restaurants. Everyone agreed, though, that there are just too many dishes to do. My friend's feedback echoed the experience of the people in my virtual cookery classes. Cooking is a means of connection to people, even those separated by thousands of miles. During quarantine, I have taught some private classes, a retirement celebration, a father and daughter get together, one, a surprise birthday party linking 18 households from Florida to California. I emailed the recipients the recipes a few days ahead of time. They shopped for the ingredients prior to the class, and then at the appointed time, we cooked together. We laughed, they told familial stories. We chopped, they asked questions. We whisked vinaigrettes and tasted as we went along. Despite the physical separation, they were connected through the dishes that they prepared together, experienced the same aromas in their kitchens, and tasted the same food. Once all the recipes were complete, I handed over the controls of the Zoom platform to the participants and stepped away. They sat down to eat together, laptops propped open on the dining table, sharing their homes and the same meal with each other. After every class, I have received almost identical comments. Despite the miles that separates us, we were able to have dinner together, sharing the same meal. Such is the power of food. It nourishes us, body and soul.